All right, today we're going to be talking about the unforgivable sin. This is something that's confused and intrigued people for a long time. And I'm going to show you in the Bible what the unforgivable sin is. This is Cliff and Stuart Nectel. I think that's how you say the last name on Alex O'Connor. This is like a three and a half hour interview. I'm only going to react to like 10 minutes maybe. And I have it on 1.25 speed. So I'm going to pause it and talk. That's what a reaction video is. If you don't want to watch me reacting to it, go watch the original video. I'll link that down below. Please don't comment saying, please don't pause it and talk. That's the point of a reaction video. So here we go. We're going to jump into this. And at some point, I'll show you what the unforgivable sin is in the Bible. It's actually super simple. I'm not sure why we've always overcomplicated it. The Bible makes it clear what it is. But let's jump into this. Jesus says that every sin will be forgiven or can be forgiven, except one. Mm -hmm. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is the sin which will never be forgiven. Now, Jesus says this, I mean, our earliest source will be Mark chapter 3, speaking to the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees accuse Jesus. In this interview, he's asking them nonstop hard hitting questions. Um, nothing, no easy questions in this interview. And then this is one of them. Of being demonic. They say that the reason he's able to cast out demons of people is because he is a demon himself. He is Satan, whatever it is. And Jesus says, how can this be the case? A, a house divided cannot stand. You know, if, if I'm a demon, I can't be casting out demons. But then, then he goes on to say that all sins can be forgiven, but blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not and cannot be forgiven. Mm -hmm. I provide the context there because I'm told that it's quite important. This is enough to send a shiver down your spine. Jesus saying, if you do this thing, you will not be forgiven. I've heard stories of Christians who sort of are up at night in cold sweat thinking, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? When I made that joke at Christmas about bringing in the Holy Spirits, was that, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit and why is it unforgivable? Mm -hmm. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, I would relate to Romans chapter one, when Paul talks about how eventually God gave them over to their own desires. So blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not, I'm driving down the merit and all of a sudden I get into this incredible road rage and I curse at somebody or I curse at God. And that are the last words on my lips and I die in this road rage. So it's a sin I'm committing at the end of my life. So it's obviously it's going to send me to hell. No, it has nothing to do with that. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is deciding on my own, my own volition. It's like Pharaoh, to be honest, that's another example of hardening my own heart. And then eventually God hardens my heart. So it's, I'm going to live any old way I want to, Romans chapter one, and then God gives me over to my own desires. And so it's, it's not a specific act. It's instead, it's grieving the Holy Spirit, living in line with the flesh, not the spirit. Because if you're living in line with the genuine spirit, you're growing out of the fruits of the spirit, Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control in a botanical kind of way. It's always shown as fruit. So you're supposed to be growing in these areas. So blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the only unforgivable sin is back to your original question. Can I just ask for forgiveness at the end of my life? And God, you'll just grant me my wish to go into heaven. Kira Knightley, live any old way you want. And it's so easy for Christians because then at the end of their lives, they can just say, God, forgive me. No Kira. I love Pirates of the Caribbean, but no Kira. That's completely wrong. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, God, I'm playing a dirty trick with you. I think you'll forgive me no matter what. So I'm going to live any old kind of way that I want. And then eventually God gives you over to those desires. No, the, th the thing. He's going to push back and we'll react in the next like 10 minutes. But I want to, I think he's partially right. I just want to show you guys what the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. And the guy actually interviewing him kind of alluded to it earlier. It's actually super simple. So this is Matthew chapter 12. And I'm just going to give, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I just want to show you. Remember in the Bible, originally when it was written, there was no verses or chapters. So we have to read it as just like one long letter. So I want you to see this, okay? Verse 22. I'm gonna, just going to show you. It's very, very simple what it is. One was brought who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, and the blind mute b both spoke and saw. Everyone was amazed, and in a nutshell, they said, this is amazing. Could this be the son of David? Now the Pharisee said, very important, this fellow does not cast out demons except by, the, by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, which is Satan. So they're saying Jesus is using satanic power to cast out demons. Jesus says every king divided himself is not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Now listen, this is very important. Verse 28. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can you enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods? Okay, now pay attention. So he's casting out demons. This is the context. He's using the power of God. He's using the Holy Spirit. They're saying he's using demonic power. Then what happens next? This is all connected, remember, right? All connected. So it's all, this is the context. Casting out demons by Satan's power. Verse 35. Therefore, I say to you, 
Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that's speaking sacrilegiously against the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. So you speak against Jesus, he goes, you'll be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in, either in this age or the age to come. Then he talks about knowing a tree by its fruit. Here's the point. When you attribute what the Lord is doing, the work of the Spirit, casting out demons, healing the sick, speaking in tongues, the things that the Holy Spirit does in a person, and you say that's the devil, that's demonic, you are actively engaging in the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Is there a component where you reject God? I think so. Is there a component, as uh, Cliff and Stuart go on here to say, where you're denying him and you're hardening your heart? I think that's part of it, but I, I don't personally think that's the context of this specific question the guy's asking. The specific context is attributing the work of God's spirit to the work of a demonic spirit, saying that's demonic. And to that person that says, I'm afraid I'm blaspheming the Holy Spirit, if you're worried that you're doing it, you're probably not doing it. This is open rebellion to the work of the Holy Spirit, saying the Holy Spirit's work is demonic, and then standing before God and Jesus saying, you rejected God because the Holy Spirit is equally God as Jesus is God and as the Father is God. They're all equal. And he's saying, I can't let you in because you've rejected God. In rejecting and blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you've also rejected and blasphemed me and the Father. And nobody comes to the Father but through the Son. So that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's very scary when you start saying this is demonic when it's the Lord moving and working in somebody's life or in somebody's heart. His ways are not our ways. So that's very, very clear. That's the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And it's not a one-time thing. It's a lifestyle of calling the work of God demonic and rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. All right, so let's keep going here. The thing that really strikes me about this is unforgivable. Like forgiveness is something that is done retrospectively for something that's already been done and now regretted and apologized for. And so I understand the idea that like there are people who become so consumed with their own desires that their hearts are hardened mm -hmm. that maybe for some reason God then like reinforces that by extra hardening their heart or whatever, but, but, but like locking it in somehow as if to say that, I mean, what does it mean for it to be unforgivable? It means that if that person does that, they live that way. I mean, suppose I've been thinking to myself like, well, I'm not sure if I should really be living this way, but I'm sure that one day I'll have a religious experience and I, you know, I'm sure God will forgive me and it'll be okay. I'm starting to live like that, right? I'm starting to do that. And then one day I... What was I thinking? This is, this is, this is terrible. I, I, I should never have done that. I'm really sorry about it. Well, tough luck. You can't be forgiven. You don't have to worry about that. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means I have played so many games with God that I've reached the point where my heart is so hard. I never hear the voice of God. I am not sorry for the wrong that I've done. Therefore, the only people who've blasphemed the Holy Spirit are those who could give a rip. They're totally unconcerned because they're totally dead towards God in their spirit. Pharaoh, six times hardens his heart. Then we read the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, you take the first six times out and you're thinking, what, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart? What does that mean? No, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And I can do that. We all can do that. But if a person has any desire at all to say, Lord, forgive me, of course the Lord forgives them. It's only those who have no desire to ask for forgiveness who have possibly committed that sin. So, so why does God then harden the Pharaoh's heart, right? His heart, he's already hardening his heart. Why is it that God does this extra thing? I'm now going to harden your heart. As, as if, like the imagery I'm getting there, if this is indeed what something like blaspheming the Holy Spirit is and becomes the unforgivable sin, it's almost like God himself is like locking that in. It's like, well, Pharaoh's been hardening his heart. He's been, you know, rejecting God's advances. And so God's- I think it's more of God turning you over to your own sin as Romans chapter one talks about. You get a, you get a debased mind. It's a scary place when you're in sin, hearing convicting sermons and preaching the word of God. And at one time in your life, you were convicted and you were challenged. And now you're unconcerned with your sin. That's that hardening, that rejection of God saying, Lord, I don't want you in my life. And you reject him enough. And God says, okay, you don't want me. I'm done with you. You harden your heart towards me. You don't want me. I'm going to turn you over to your own sin. And again, that's Romans it says, 1. says, okay, I'm going to grab you by hold of the heart. And I'm going to sort of switch off this possibility for you. As, as if God is like doing that to Pharaoh. All right. Well, no, he's why, not why doing do that do to that? Pharaoh. It's, it's more a statement that, Pharaoh, you have hardened your heart so much that you are now shutting yourself off from me. Mm. No, the, the, the offer of Christ, the offer of God for forgiveness is always open to every single human being. Mm. And there are countless illustrations of the grace of God working with some of the biggest wretches on earth. So we don't have to worry about that. But is it impossible in principle for somebody to have once blasphemed the Holy Spirit and then regret it? Yeah, that's, that's not going to happen. Because when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you don't have the ability to repent. You don't have the ability to be sensitive towards God because you are so hardened, so separated from God 
there's no hope for you. That, that, that sort of seems to make it worse to me. It's like, and it's interesting because I would say people that call the work of the Holy Spirit demonic, which are those that blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I've ever met anybody or heard anybody who lives that life and then repents later. It seems to be that they always stay that way. They always stay that that's demonic. This is what God is doing is of the devil, which is so scary place to be. But I don't know that I've ever seen anybody, at least publicly or someone with a platform that has gone back and said I was wrong, whether it's miracles, deliverance, speaking in tongues, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of prophecy, whatever work the Holy Spirit's doing. I was wrong. That isn't of the devil. And I repent. I don't know that I've ever seen that. These guys that do that have a hard heart. They're bitter. They're resentful. They're religious. They're like the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they live that way forever. And it's scary. But they will be accountable to God one day on judgment. Or whatever I may have, because this is the thing is that you might say, well, well look, you're, you hardened your heart. You did this. You turned yeah. yourself away from God. And so, so now you're in a state where you can't even possibly come to repentance. And I would say, well, that seems a little unfair, you know? So, well, it's your fault you did it. But the whole point of Christianity is that like, well, yeah, you did this. Yeah, you did that. You did that for years, but I'm still going to forgive you as long as you regret it. But you're telling me that there's something a person can do that makes it such that it is literally impossible for them even to want to repent, you know, let alone being forgiven for it. Uh, that, that seems like really difficult to square with the with the sort of eternally forgiving God, you know, like we're talking about something that's unforgivable. When you say, well, if somebody dies in a state where, where their heart is hardened to God, well, that's true of any sin. If you die in, in sin without repentance, you know, you're not going to be entered into the, the you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. To say that this is unforgivable, and, and you're, you're telling me now something like, well, they've done something to the extent that now it does not matter what they do, they will never be able to repent. It's a full lifestyle, though. It's mm. just like in Matthew 25, when Jesus is talking about the sheep and the goats, he's saying, I never knew you, depart from me. Uh -huh. I never knew you, depart from me. The Pharisees. You can tell the guy interviewing them is super hungry for God. He just has the curse of certainty. Everything has to be exact, has to make sense to him. And you got to remember, the Bible says, his, the Lord's ways are not our ways. So you'll never fully grasp or understand these principles. And we're going to go crazy trying to, like, explain eternity. You can't. Your mind's finite. So sometimes we have to just go, his ways are in our ways, and I just trust him. And I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. Shiny on the outside with the cup, yep. but completely rotten on the inside. Their father's the devil. Okay, yeah. that's blasphemy as the Holy Spirit, where it's a hypocritical, hypocritical lifestyle all life long. But there's no way that those Pharisees could ever have snapped out of it and been like, I don't know what I was thinking. I was wrong. I regret it. I'm sorry, Lord. No. I, and Jesus again, wouldn't forgive them? We may disagree on this point, but Pharaoh... I think God judges Pharaoh. I, th I think it was Pharaoh's free will at first, but then I think judgment came. Mm. And thank heaven it came. Pharaoh was a nasty, brutish guy, was he not? Mm. So, so judgment day, I'm looking forward to because I think, I think judgment needs to happen. Um, at the same time, I'm not looking forward to it because I realize I've done wrong. Mm. But so, so for me, it's, yes, God eventually judges. But I, I think you keep taking blasphemy against the Holy Spirit as like a one-time thing because you, you started off this way. You, you started off making it sound like you're at a Christmas party and all of a sudden you said the wrong thing against the Holy yeah. Spirit and you're going to hell. Yeah. Well, that's radically different from what we're talking about. Well, we know yeah. it's not that, right? But, but I think there are things that you can do. I mean, all kinds of things. You could be in, a, in an adulterous affair for 10 years. I have a hard time fully grasping this principle, but it does seem to be that in the text of Matthew 15, it is, a, it is actually an action they do where it's they say, they say this man is casting out demons by the devil's power. And then Jesus goes, that is unforgivable in this age or in the age to come. You saying that I'm using the devil's power to work miracles, I, it's just God decides. He makes the rules to all of this. And it's a, it was like a one-time act or a one-time event. And he says, that's not forgivable. So I don't know. I do believe it's a rejecting of the Holy Spirit in your life. It makes more sense that way. But then also, when I read the text, I see it as it is, it is a one-time occurrence in the text of where they did something. And then Jesus says, that's blasphemy. Which blasphemy is like, speaking sacrilegiously about something holy speaking profane about something holy and jesus goes like you're this is the holy spirit's very holy his name is literally holy spirit is what he is but his name is actually holy and you're saying he's unholy you're saying he's unclean and you're comparing him to the devil like that should strike fear in the heart of people now people that do that we're are going to watch this video the guys online that do that saying, this is the devil, this is the devil, all these charismatics are the devil, all these panic. They're going to watch this video. They're going to scoff at me and say, that's not what it means. And they're going to laugh because their heart has already been hardened. They're already in a state of blasphemy. And they have, they have no fear watching this. They'll have no fear listening to this interview. They have no fear when they read Matthew 15. But if any of us have ever done that, there should be fear in our heart for sure. Yeah, it's something you do over 10 years. And then on you know, the very next day, you could suddenly realize it was wrong, suddenly repent of it. And if, as long as you're genuine, you're forgiven. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that there's something people can do 
Say not asking for forgiveness. But like, that's, I mean, yeah, if, you don't, if, if I steal your wallet and you say, Cliff, I offer to forgive you. And I say, forgive me for what? I haven't done anything wrong. Oh no, Cliff, you stole my wallet. Well, so what? Yeah. So, so then I say that what you're doing there is unforgivable, right? I, I'm not going to forgive you for what you're doing right now. And so then tomorrow when you come to me and say, you know, yesterday when I was sort of like refusing to even acknowledge, I, 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 I'm, I was wrong. I'm sorry about that. And I say, hey man, I already told you, I'm not forgiving you for that. Christ will always forgive the person who is repentant. Mm. The blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an unrepentant, hardened heart. Mm. There's no need, there, there's no understanding of my need for forgiveness. And once you get into that state, there's no possibility for redemption. Correct. So like, I mean, what, what are you imagining? Like how old is a person in this state? Like how long does it take? What do they have to do? You know, we don't have the faintest idea because, because who those people are, or what they've done. I we don't know. That's that, between them and God. I find that so, so difficult. Like it, it's sure it's difficult. Unforgivable. Because they're not asking for forgiveness. Correct. Mm. You okay. cannot be forgiven unless you ask for forgiveness. It's, you so, humble so yourself. That's a good point unforgivable too. to that's a good point. You can't be forgiven if you're not, not asking ask for it. forgiveness. Mm -hmm. but the, 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 the problem is there's sort of two levels here, right? There's like, there's not asking for forgiveness, which of course you can't be forgiven if you don't ask for forgiveness. But we're saying here now, it's not, you can't be forgiven if you don't ask for forgiveness. It's you can't be forgiven for the state of not asking for forgiveness. If not asking, if blaspheming the Holy Spirit is something like not asking for forgiveness, to say that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable is not to say that when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you know, you, you like you, you're not going like, okay. You're not being forgiven right now because you're not apologizing. There's one thing to say, you're not being forgiven for not apologizing. It's another thing to say that you will not be forgiven, like full stop ever, for the fact that right now you're unforgiven. You see what I'm saying? The only person who's committed that sin could care less. Mm. God is irrelevant. God is not part of the equation. My sin is not part of the equation. I'm totally shut off. Mm. It's a lifestyle, not a one-time thing. Right. Because it sounds like you keep picking it back to a one-time thing, but we're saying it's a full lifestyle. Sure, age of accountability, you bring in 12 years old. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, after right. 12, maybe. But it's the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25. I understand it's a terrifying passage. We've had some students come to us crying. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. So we need safe spaces for them. But I think for us, it's a matter of what are your motives? When I am sitting in an Uber with a Hindu, going to a temple with a Hindu, and sitting in an Uber with a Muslim, I hear very similar things when it comes to, I have to do X, Y, and Z to get out of this caste in order to get out of a certain cycle. I have to do X, Y, and Z for my heart to be lighter than a feather to get to paradise. It's all me, me, me. I have to do these things mm -hmm. versus I'm doing these things. But what is my true motive? Motives don't matter here with these two. It's just you have to do good things. Here it's a heart motive in the sense of who am I doing it for? Why am I doing it, God? Am I genuine in my relationship with you? Am I genuinely loving you? Am I genuinely loving others? Or is this simply just a, a sick game or it's a hypocritical lifestyle? And I think we all know, let's be real. I think we all know when we're living in a hypocritical kind of way. And the answer is if you, if you do that for long enough, then you just enter into a state where now, for the rest of your life, no matter what you do. No, not no matter what you do. If you repent, you'll be forgiven. But these people can't repent, right? Because they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It's impossible for them to repent. They have so hardened their hearts that they have no interest in repenting. Yeah, I think the thing is they don't repent. That's what Cliff is trying to say, is they don't repent. If you have a slight interest in repenting, Christ will forgive you. Mm. Do you think it's possible to be in a state where you have no interest in repentance for 10 years, and then the 11th year, regain it somehow good sure that happens to many people yeah so they those people didn't last in the holy spirit for 10 no. years and they were sinners mm. but they chose to repent and that's that's well that's the thief on the cross mm. the thief on the cross just remember him yeah i mean i, I must admit it's, it's one of the most theological theologically troubling things i mean there's there's troubling and then there's troubling right like i find the old testament passages mm -hmm. troubling because i could tell they're kind of they're kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'll link this video down below. It's definitely an interesting conversation. I would like to hear your guys' thoughts as well on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It seems very, very clear in scripture to me what it is in Matthew 15. It's attributing the work of God to Satan. It's when you say when the Holy Spirit's doing something, that must be the devil. And in turn, you're closing yourself off to God. You're not going to repent and turn from your ways when you're acknowledging that what God is doing is demonic. You're just completely twisted and perverting your thinking. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody who's in that lifestyle blaspheming the Holy Spirit ever repent. Maybe they have. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't, I don't think any of us know exactly. We'll ever know exactly until we stand before God on what it is. But I would say if you're worried that you've done it, you probably haven't. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let him move in your life. Let me know what you guys think about this video. My book just came out. Pre-order in the description. How to cast out demons. Interesting. We're talking about casting out demons in the text. This book's all about casting out demons. And it has that Matthew 15 in the book. We're live Monday as I knock stuff over. We're live Monday, Tuesday at six o'clock and then Thursday at noon. I'll go to our live tab. We have tons of teaching and videos, hundreds of hours of preaching. The video tab is like just reactions and some sermons. 
go to the live tab that on the page. That's where everything you need is, is at all the teachings, all the work we put in the live, get the least amount of views, but the most amount of work to so go check those out. And we'll see you guys in the next video. God bless.